but those first four years, it wasn't just the burden of a disease. It was the burden of a family secret that I had to hide. So if I was sick, I couldn't tell people I had to just lie. Like I was a good liar um, during that time. And I just didn't think, um, you know, I didn't want the neighbors not bringing their kids over to play with my kids because they were afraid of our house. Go out there together. Good to see you back here on The Pulse. Well, today we're going to talk about something that really doesn't necessarily cross your mind. What if I told you that you have another six months, a year, maybe three years to live? How would you react? What would be your first feeling and thought? And I asked myself this question and then I started researching what other people would say if they found out they have a fatal illness and they will be plugged, unplugged out of their current world, be it within the family, be it within a thriving career, life in general. A lot of people in that survey that I researched would just say, okay, I'm going to see all of my friends, of course say goodbye to my loved ones. One of them said, well, I would leave my password. I guess that is more a person that, um, I don't know, was born in the digital age. Other people very rationally going, okay, I need to look after my family. So I'm going to look after the inheritance, sell the house or do what have you. But I think it's a very interesting story to look into that if death is all of a sudden really there and a real option. What does it really do to your life? I came across this fantastic book. It's called Still Positive by Julie Lewis together with Jenny Koenig. This is the incredible story of Julie who was diagnosed with HIV virus uh, after having had three children and she was diagnosed when all of her children were either two four or six years old that she would survive another three maybe five years if she was lucky she published still positive which is a collection of beautiful memories flashbacks during that time over the last well 30 years and how life shifted for her and i'm so honored julie that you're with me here on on the pulse to discuss a very private, intimate issue for you, especially, of course, but in general, an issue that a lot of people don't even dare to think about. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The first thing that came across my mind, apart from asking myself the question, how would I have reacted was, how did you react when you were sitting there and, and all of a sudden you got that phone call? Uh, telling you, please, could we just check on you? Because perhaps you could be contaminated with the HIV virus. How did the whole thing really start for you? And what was that initial gut reaction feeling? I mean, in context, I was literally moving um, to a different city that um, five hours away. So we were literally just packing boxes and putting them in a giant truck. And this was in 1990. I had not been feeling well uh, for over a year and had gone to a doctor many, many times, um, not a doctor, many doctors. And, um, you know, all of the tests they did came back normal. So, you know, doctors would say, well, you have those three little kids, you're just exhausted. And I knew in my gut that was not it. Um, because I've always had a lot of energy and um, it, I just, it, something was very off. I knew this. When a phone call starts out with, you'd better sit down. I mean, you know, it's going to be like, not great. And, and the doctor who called was a personal friend. So when he first said that, I thought, oh, one of our friends died. Like that was my initial thought. And then he started in and he said, you know, the blood transfusion that you had in 1984, when my oldest daughter was born. Well, the blood bank called and one of the people who donated blood has has AIDS. And so you need to go get a test. Well, in that moment, I just knew I was positive. Like, um, I hoped I wasn't. But 
it just was the answer that I'd been searching for. And so in that moment, I think you just go into this, you know, I think when any trauma happens or tragedy, you kind of go into this space that's like, um, you you can't think very much. Like, you, you just kind of <laughs> hope this isn't a nightmare that it's real, you know, and um I remember looking at my husband just because he could hear the phone call, even though, you know, the phone was on the wall, like this back in the olden days, no cell phones. And um, I was looking at him like, just give me like a look, like we're going to be okay. (laughs) So I think I immediately was just looking for like um, someone to be in this with and, um, and like, oh my God, you know, but you're also just sort of not, you're a little detached in these moments, like, because they're just so sur- surreal and unreal. Um, but then as time goes on, it sinks in, like, what's really going on? And I I think it took weeks for it to sink in for me. Um, we had to get my kids tested and my husband tested Um because it had been six and a half years and Scott and I were having babies. So of course we weren't using protection. And then two of my kids were born to an HIV positive mom. I mean, after I got my first test and it came back positive, my whole family had to go get tested. And when their tests came back negative, I just breathe, you know, I breathed a big sigh of relief uh, because it could have been so much worse. And I think just my mom instinct kicked in, like, I can do this, let's move, you know, like, and then it wasn't really till I was at the doctor's office. And, and he asked me, are your things in order? And do you have a living will? And I was 32 years old. And I'm like, this is bad. And then he, I said, well, how long do I have to live? And he goes, well, if you're lucky, maybe three to five years. Um, but the last two years are going to be terrible. So do what you want to do right now. And that was like, I just started doing the math. And I'm like, Ryan, who's two, I won't even see on a three-year plan. I won't even see him start kindergarten. So that's when, you know, the real depression. And and then I went on medication. They made me sick. So I, I think it was a gradual you know, realization that, you know, I'm going to die soon, but it didn't just happen in the moment for me. And there are so many things you, you just already mentioned that um, we're going to pick up on in our conversation. And I think this evolution of the actual impact, what does it mean? Because having a diagnosis is Mm -hmm. one thing, Having then an estimate of a potential three to five years to live is another thing. But the third thing is really to go through every single layer that is actually your life and to see what is the impact. I mean, we don't do anything in a vacuum and nothing happens to us in a vacuum. Absolutely. And and in 1990, the disease of AIDS was unique. It wasn't something that you told people. Um you know, especially with little kids, I re- the first thing I wanted to do, um, I well, first of all, I have a gay brother who happens to also have HIV. And by 1990, so many of his friends had died. And I'm also a health teacher. So I knew a lot about HIV. And I had seen how people treat people with HIV. And I was moving to a new city. And my husband was in full time Christian ministry. So that's just like, a loaded deck right there. Um, When a disease is getting, you know, a lot of judgment, a lot of fear. Um, So I just looked at my three little kids and went, we're not telling anyone this, you know, so I was in a vacuum dealing with this. I had a few close friends, thank God, who I could lean on. Um, My family knew, but those first four years, it wasn't just the burden of a disease. It was the burden of a family secret that I had to hide. So if I was sick, I couldn't tell people I had to just lie. Like I was a good liar um, during that time. And I just didn't think, um, you know, I didn't want the neighbors not bringing their kids over to play with my kids because they were afraid of our house. So that it's just a whole, um, it's a pretty unique situation. Um, I mean, I've seen some of this come back with COVID, but it's like, in 1990, people were afraid and we were moving to a very rural area. It was a big town, but rural. 
And um, there was a lot of misinformation um, and fear around HIV and a lot of judgment. And because I wasn't telling people, people would just be, you know, talk. If you brought up AIDS, they would really tell you what they thought because they had no idea I was dealing with it. So, no, I think this is uh, so, so powerful what you're saying that in a way, what I mentioned the, the term vacuum saying that whatever happens to me actually has a ripple effect across, you know, when one, one person is sick in the family, the whole family is sick, is touched by that sickness because everything in terms of dynamics, thinking, behavior, communication changes, but you took it exactly from what you actually went through that you had to create a vacuum because the prejudice in those years, and I remember them very, very well because it was just in my time where I hit adolescence, became sexually active, that, you know, HIV and AIDS was um, was not only a theme, but there was, I want to say, a bit of a scaremongering around it. But then there was a bit like, oh, yeah, but it's a gay disease. Okay, so the stigmatization, yeah. which I thought was, on one hand, you know, for somebody that is heterose heterosexual, you go like, oh, doesn't touch me. It's like COVID. Oh, Chinese disease has nothing to do with me. But yeah, well, you know, the, the history has been written on this one. So you had to really create a vacuum to protect your family in those things, and uh, because of this, and I and I wonder, you know, when I was reading your memoirs, and you was like, I even have a brother that that has HIV. I'm just thinking, okay, how does the whole family need to feel about this? Quickly moving away from mm -hmm. your nucleus, but going broader into your original family with a with your brother, and then of course you have a good relationship with your with your father, especially mm -hmm. once you came out. You know, how did that hit? I mean, with you and your brother, I guess, great. You know, we found each other. We can hold on to each other. Oh, yeah, my God. You it's know, it's true. Yeah, my brother was my biggest, um, you know, he was my person uh, I, and my husband. But I mean, it's, my brother had been diagnosed in 1986. So he was just further down the road as far as like knowing how to treat the disease, Um you know, he had a lot of hope. He had a lot of friends who were living pretty well, even though he had a lot of friends who had died. Um, I think Magic Johnson com uh, coming out in 1992 really opened the door um, to people seeing that it wasn't a, a gay disease and that families were dealing with it. You know, as sad as that news was, it did make me feel like I wasn't alone. Um with my family. And um, I didn't tell my parents right away because my brother didn't want to tell them. Um, about him or and, about And you? you can you can do that. You know, you don't die of AIDS. You die of uh, other diseases because you're immunocompromised. So he was like, I'm just going to tell him I have pneumonia or I have cancer or whatever I get. But he just didn't want them to have that burden. But I actually really needed them because I had three kids and I needed help. So, um, and I'm, I'm just not as, you know, I can't lie to my parents. It, it was just too hard, but it, for we, it was probably eight months, um, of talking about it. And finally he said, you can tell them. And I said, I'm not telling him about me without telling him about you. That's just too weird. So he said, you can tell them, um, but I don't want to be there. And I started laughing. I said, I don't want to be there either. <laughs> and, um, so we got to my parents and uh, to tell them, and I literally couldn't do it. And so my husband told them. Um, oh, Scott you know, did it. He, he yeah, I, you know, I'm a really bad crier talker. So he, I started, and I just looked at him like, "You got to do this." So um, yeah, and it was devastating. I mean, now that I'm their age, I'm like, it would be devastating if one of my kids came and said that two of them had a you know, a disease they were supposed to die of. I can't even imagine. But in that moment, I wasn't thinking that much about how my parents were feeling because I was just dealing with my own life. Yeah. yeah. Looking I, back, you know, my dad's told me many times, I mean, he died, you know, 20 years ago, but it, he said to me many times, it doesn't matter how old your kids are. The worst thing in the world would be losing one of your kids. And now I get that, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I was wondering about, you know, is one feeling in a way responsible to do that to your family? I just wonder, would I be, even though 
one is the victim, especially in your case, having contracted HIV through uh, through blood transfusion, you really are a victim. I mean, you know, you could always argue that if you're going out and have promiscuous sex, that uh, you will you might have sexual transmitted disease at some point. The likelihood is either uh, is higher. I wonder, was that ever something on on your mind or in your feelings where you you went through the motions of feeling like a victim? um grieving in a way your life past um on the other hand feeling also anger why me um or did you did you think oh my god what am i doing here i'm the mother i'm supposed to be supporting now i'm the mother and i'm the sick mother i need support i'm not the strong wife i'm now the you know the wife that needs does one go through from a victim trip to a guilt trip how how is the evolution? How how do we have to imagine this? Well, I'm glad you used the word victim because um, it's something you know. People like to have an AIDS gradient. They like to like you know, uh, as far as compassion goes, we call it the compassion gradient. Then the speakers bureau used to be on. It's like you know, the child born with AIDS is there in the top, and then the blood transfusion recipient. You know, you just go down the line. Like, how bad were you to get this disease? And I hate that word victim. I, I never really went down that road. And I think it was because, um, you know, my brother is one of the people I love most in the whole world. I would never think that he deserved this more than me. I think everyone with HIV and AIDS has been a victim. It's a, it's a disease. We, we don't do that with other diseases. You don't usually, if someone says they have lung cancer, you don't go, well, you've smoked that pack of cigarettes. You're all like, you know, like, it's just, it's, it's weird, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, that people just um, don't have the same compassion for all sick people. You know, I have never felt like a victim. I, I never really was mad at whoever, you know, whoever, donate the blood I could have very easily been that person I didn't know I had HIV for six and a half years they weren't testing the blood for part of that time I could have given blood I could have been infected someone so it's you know and anyone who you know most of us have had sex um at some point uh, very silly sex most yeah. responsible that is exactly. probably in the norm right so how can we just Gosh. pick and choose who we think is innocent and who we think is guilty and who deserves something or not? I mean, it's a freaking disease. My God, all people with any disease deserve compassion. Like that's, you know, maybe that I'm a health teacher and I'm a public health teacher and that I'm also the sister to, you know, a gay man. I, I just... I've never seen it like that. Um, I, I think I, but I get asked that. I, I got asked that a lot in the early days. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, you don't deserve this. I'm like, no one deserves this. Yeah, yeah I know? thought that, that what also how you write about it in the book is very, very strong. And I wonder to what extent it is also your strong faith. I mean, your family is embedded in, in you know, Bible, you're doing Bible groups, you 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 have that community, um, that religion, literally. Uh, and I wonder, because I'm not so sure if I wouldn't be totally mad, and I'm not so sure if people wouldn't just sue the hell out of whoever gave them the blood, blood transfusion, or even the doctors before not checking for the HIV virus, whilst I was, uh, you know, doing the odyssey from one doctor to the next, trying to find out what's wrong with me. Obviously, something is wrong with me, and nobody even looking at that potential because hey you're not yeah. gay so i don't need to check you for hiv i mean yeah, still exactly. <laughs> yeah so i was a clearly in an in a risk group and you know i think people just looked at me and little kids um and just didn't think about it you know you didn't take the box but in terms of your inner strength i would like to look at it because i thought it was so remarkable and i wonder to what extent you know that hope that strength not to point fingers even though you could have uh, pointed fingers and and having that that strength to just pull through to what extent was that also based on um you know being religious and and having faith and how important is it to have faith in this kind of situation wow 
Or do you question it? I mean, the other way around, you know, you go I like, think I've done now? everything <laughs> <laughs> all over the place. Um, but I, do, I have a, I do have a solid belief that there is a God out there. And, and I believe that God takes, I believe that God takes on many forms to many different people. I mean, I wasn't always in that belief, but I, that's where I'm at now you know, 8 billion people on the world, I got to think that God's pretty creative. So to think that we have to narrow everything down to one way, I just, I'm just not there. Um, but I've always just had this faith that I'm going to be okay. Like, like I, I'm going to be okay. Um, I'm okay with dying. What was so hard was leaving, like was looking at my kids and thinking what I would miss. Um, you know, I wouldn't see Ryan get into school. And even even as like I would see things, it was like um, when I met Jenny in early 2000, you know, my daughter didn't think I'd be at her wedding still because our friends were still dying, especially the long term survivors. And um, just that longing to um that they would remember me that you know like these were the things that were really hard um the actual dying I was not afraid of that um and I did feel like with my faith all of these gaps that would be left in my kids life I did have faith that God would provide for them but it was still sad I mean like you, you can't get around the sadness no you know um of of leaving your children and just the idea that, you know, they might not even remember me or, you know, surely my good looking, awesome husband is going to get remarried and they're going to be called, you know, their kids are going to be calling someone else grandma, not me, you know? So there's all these sad things that you have to, you have to visit these, you have to have the grief. You can't go around it. It's it, depression will come out sideways. It's like, you have to actually go there and that's that's hard. Everyone wants to avoid it. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think you know, in the in, in in hindsight, looking back, I think for you going there, as you were just saying, turned out extremely valuable for you, as in your person. For sure, for sure. And you know, it took. I did a lot of bargaining with God. If I'm really, really good, if I give my whole life to you, if I do this and do that, can you just give me a few more years? Like you know, there was always this like hope that you know, if I if I did good things for the world, maybe, you know, things would come back to me. And and it's not like they haven't, but that's no guarantee, you know. That it, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we did the 3030 project um, in honor of my friends who had died. But at the end of the day, when it was done, they didn't come back to life. You know, like, it's still sad. Yeah. You know, so and we'll talk about we'll talk about the 3030 project as well in a little while. But what I think is so um, interesting to look into, you know, when I think to myself that um, I have to leave Victoria, my, my daughter, and she was by no means, I mean, she's 18 and a half. So she's grown. She's at university. Um, but your children are always your children, as your dad said as well. It doesn't really matter how old you are or how old they yeah. are. If, if your child dies, it's just it's just a no no go but also uh, whenever since I'm a mother whenever I'm taking an airplane or something or get myself into a, a little bit of a iffy situation where you think oh my god I'm on this mountain what's going to happen if all of a sudden a storm breaks out I always speak out to to the energies above and say yes. please make me survive not for me I mean it gets really clinical and sure. radical, but for Victoria I want to be there for her and that is like always my first motivation just let me survive because I know she needs me and um, I was just talking to a friend of mine uh, an hour ago and he said you know once people said the bigger the children get the less they will need you not true <laughs> okay <laughs> they grow yeah. they grow up and you know it's not it, and it seems that the problems or the questions or the needs grow with them so we will always be in demand and I think that is something that is very very heartbreaking and touching where you also think I'm going to let my child down. I'm not going to be there, not for her uh, beautiful moments, but especially for the moments where they go, mommy, what we still do. I mean, my, my mom passed two years uh, ago and I'm thinking, geez, I, I really would like to discuss this with my mom. And I yeah. just cannot, I mean, I can, okay. Spiritually, but I cannot. Yeah. yeah I, um, I do remember 
the point where you stopped thinking about it. Um, and that was um, when my oldest daughter told me that she was pregnant. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I just thought, um, yeah, you know, it's like I'm a grandma. And at that point, I just kind of stopped thinking about death and dying. And, and I'm just like, everything from here on out is icing on the cake. You know, it's like, yeah. And, and I, it, it was just kind of a great day to just go, you know, all these things I keep hoping I could see, hoping I could do. And I'm just like, I'm a grandma, like, you know, this is, this is it. I'm, you know, <laughs> I made it kind of, you know, but it was just a, a great time. Now I have six grandkids, but it's like, you know, I just feel like every day is a gift and um, I'm amazed that I'm, I'm still here. Like it's been 39 years and um, yeah. So I think that, that for years I just kept, you know, fighting for more time. And then now I'm just like, I'm a freaking senior citizen. It's like, I can stop thinking about You that. don't look like a freaking senior <laughs> citizen just because you have grandchildren. I mean, do you, I always have two acquired grandchildren, but still. <laughs> no. yeah. But I know, I know, I know what you mean. And what you're touching on um, is also something during my research when people commented on what, what would you do um, if you had this, um, this kind of very uh, horrible terminal news. And um, one of the writers said, you know, tomorrow is promised to no one. It's so and, true. And you better get up with this thought every single day. I mean, it comes back to the good old, very battered carpe diem. Um, but only this kind of thing really hammers it home. And I think you having that, that threat that you wouldn't even see Ryan go to school. You know, yeah. when you had the news and then being there basically three generations on, including yeah. yours, is amazing. Uh, on that note, though, a couple of things, because also one of the reasons why you um, started 3030, your project, is you said straight up in the book, look, I'm one of those few very privileged ones. I could afford medication. I could afford a certain lifestyle, um, which basically kept me kept me, kept me from dying, kept me from, yeah. you know, contracting whatever my immunity system would let through because it's weakened through the HIV virus. Yeah, I, I, there was a day when um, I've always known, you know, I'm a privileged, you know, upper middle class white woman and um, and my husband has a good job and we have health insurance and I have a car to drive me to my appointments and, um, you know, that that is a huge advantage if you're sick. And, um, and then as I started working, I've always done public health. So I've always, I've always known this. I, used, I worked at the health department for a long time. And, um, but it, when I started doing work abroad, it hit me one day that even this AIDS story is a story of privilege because most women that live in rural parts of other continents they would have just died of the blood transfusion, you know, not, they wouldn't got a blood transfusion. The hemorrhage would have killed them and maybe their child too. So yeah, even the story is a story of medicine and health insurance and doctors and, you know, all of that. So it was when I started meeting women who just really didn't have access to, to quality healthcare or healthcare at all. And we're having their babies at home because the other options were they're too far away or just um, their, you know, their clinic was infested with bats or, you know, or um, rats or, you know, it wasn't clean. It, there was no running water. There's no electricity. So it's kind of like I might have a better chance just by myself at my house. So these these stories are just kind of inconceivable, you know, when when their kids are dying, you know, of malaria and there's a $3 pill that they can't get. Um, mm. It's just, it's crazy really mm. that in, in our era, you know, where there's, we have so much and so many options medically that there are many, many people who, who don't have access to the basic care that, mm. that they should have. Yeah. Uh and if I think about what you did together, especially with Ryan as well, who who helped you a lot, and it was his 
his idea, not the project itself, but to make it bigger yeah. than you actually wanted it. And of course, with his fame, he is an award-winning uh, award music uh, producer in the US and he's, uh, you know, world known. So uh, congratulations to having your little one who had the least of mummy and mummy ying, <laughs> as we find out through the book, uh, coming out so strong as a person, as a career, and even a, you know, your support in in bringing 3030 to a great success, which I thought was, was fantastic. On another note, I also think your empathy for um, other women being in your position, having still that empathy and, you know, that feeling um, of wanting other, you know, supporting others, despite Despite being in in one's own precarious situation is so strong, so inspiring. Um, do you think you've actually become a better person? Maybe it's a perverted question to ask. I don't want to say a better person, but a more evolved individual through what you have gone through. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think the more the more experiences we have that are outside our comfort zone with more people who are not like us, um, usually only makes you. A, a better person, I think. Um, my kids have had a very different life than a lot of kids. Um, they met a lot of people who um, who were in um, really adult situations that were not great as children. They just saw a lot of death. Um, one of my friends, um, seven-year-old, was born with AIDS and died and she was Ryan's age. They're only a couple days apart in age. And um, just watching that family have that experience as kids, that was one of their friends who died. Was that Kara? Was that Kara? Kara, yeah. Um, who would be 35 now. They dealt with a lot. And not only that, being with my brother so much um, and my we lived in a small town, but my brother lived in Seattle and we came here a lot. And you know, my kids just grew up in a lot of diversity and that is healthy for kids. I think when they become adults, they just have a wider, a bigger worldview. I think all of us in a weird way became better people. Um, I don't, I can't imagine, I can't imagine my life differently. So it's kind of hard to know who I would have been had this not happened to me. But I also grew up in the Marshall Islands um, and traveled a lot as a small child in the 60s, which was very unusual back then. So I, I already had a bit of a worldview, but it's different when it's on a compassion level or a care level or an inequity level, just seeing how things just aren't even. Um, we've always felt that. And I've always told my kids, we're a really privileged family. That means we have a lot of responsibility to to care for people and give yeah. back and, and help elevate people, you know, to be, um, you know, we're not the great white saviors that need to come in, but we need to help people to advocate for themselves and to have the means to do that. And, you know, so um, all my kids are pretty remarkable, not just Ryan, um, but they also all have anxiety <laughs> and, you know, it was trauma for them to grow up like that. Um, it was fear, you know, the worst thing in life, according to a counselor I went to was to lose your mother and they lived with that cloud for years. So um, everything in life's a little bittersweet and they're remarkable adults. They have great kids and they have a really compassionate worldview, but it came at a cost. I just have to say there's something about, mm. you know, putting your head in the sand <laughs> for your whole life that, that um, is easier. <laughs> so. Absolutely. I think sometimes ignorance is bliss. It really is bliss when you just go, yeah. okay, whatever. And what you are touching on there with your children and trauma, I find extremely interesting because this is a trauma, a constant fear. And I, I wanted to, to broad out exactly that part of the conversation where you said early on, which I thought was interesting, you said, you know, I don't know, I'm the way I am. I don't know what would have been me without it because I know now who I am with it and uh, ergo with my children and with them in particular because they were small. But still, you were diagnosed when you were 32. And I wondered... Um, to what extent have your values shifted since? 
um, if at all, or your priorities, or the way you, you define what is life and what is living. You know these kind of these kind of processes, and I I tell you why I, I ask you this question because I know that when I look at me before becoming a mother and after becoming a mother, I look back at myself and I say, seriously, Patricia, that was a drama? <laughs> I mean, you know, that is something that was important or that was really bad news. I mean, hello, you, you try having a child and all of a sudden everything is, as they say, put into perspective. Now, I would mm -hmm. like to really know what do you think that actually shifted in your priority list or how you perceived the community and how they reacted, the society, um, and also, yeah, deep, deep inner values. We talked a little bit about faith, but just how you judge or how you perceive things pre and post diagnosis. Well, I mean, I've had a long life. Um, so I think I've gone in and out of phases. Um, I think before the diagnosis, I had like a Pinterest life. There was no Pinterest out there, but I wanted to have the right clothes on. I wanted to have my house look so. I did not, you know, I, uh, yeah, you want to have this presentation out there of having your act together. And, you know, I wanted it all. I worked part-time, I had kids, I wanted, you know, you get it. It's like, you know, that my sofa didn't match my rug might have really bothered me. Um, yeah. And then after the diagnosis, uh, especially when I really thought I was going to die soon, hmm. I could care less about it. it. I mean, in the minute of that phone call, um, I didn't care if my dishes got packed perfectly. <laughs> like, yeah, the yeah. Things I'm, like really stressing over were just not important. And, um, and that went on for some time. Um, yeah, for some time, I was just happy to wake up. Um, I was really sick. I was semi depressed. And then it was a while into it when I just woke up one day and I kind of thought, I don't feel any more dead today than I did yesterday. I'm just gonna, I went into a lot of denial. I'm just gonna pretend like this isn't happening. And, you know, if I wake up, I'm going to go do my life kind of thing. But I would be lying to say that I didn't come full circle and start caring more after a while about the same petty little things that I cared about before, you know, um, which is maybe getting back to life or is yes, it just maybe that's just being normal. Right. But I did reach this point where I had a lot of survival guilt and just feeling like, OK, for some reason, I'm still here and other people aren't. How, how, what can I do to honor their lives? Like, like what can I, I started to think more about just a legacy. And, um, and I think a lot of people as they age start thinking that way. Um, I have a lot of friends who retire and then a couple of years later, they just feel like they need to do something that's, valuable right um at first you just want a break from your life and then all of a sudden you realize you know there's more like how can I like actually leave something significant I I'm a real control freak like I like to control things I like things to be perfect and you know I'm straight a student all that so I think one thing has really changed over the years is I just let things go way easier. I become a good enough person, like good enough, good enough. Is that a strength? I don't to stress over that, you know? <laughs> yeah, but is, is, Julie, is that actually a strength to be a good enough person rather than... It's to... been a lot healthier. <laughs> I know, especially to the mind. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, it's just kind of like, and you know, when something bothers me now, I, you know, I don't know if it's the HIV or the age, but it's kind of like, is that really that big a deal? I mean, I, um, I'm trying to give people more space and just take things a little less seriously. And, you know, we all want people to give us a break. And I just feel like I'm, I'm trying more and more in life to just um, be kinder and to not um, make a big deal out of something that isn't so well I, I think that is what for me I would say uh, I'm getting to that too where I'm going okay I'll do my best and that's all I can control and the rest as you were saying you're, you're cutting some slack other people 
you just go like, so what? It's okay. You know, we're all human. And it is kind of this empathy. Plus as well, as I mentioned earlier on, if something really um, pivotal happened, it doesn't need to be dramatic, but pivotal, for example, the, the birth of a child, it puts other things into perspective. You judge it differently because I always say, you know, the truth is always created by the context so you pull out a certain piece of imp information out of the context it changes completely the narrative so so i think with your narrative changing there is is uh this kind of hey you know there's there's bigger things in life than to worry about uh, what i was really perfect about before and i also that... feel like that one other thing that i think has really changed in me is just this realization that everyone's on their own path and that you can't change other people but you can give them space you know and most of the time even if you feel like something's coming at you in a negative way it's it's more about that other person and and so I'm less defensive um than I used to be especially just we, we only know the tip of the iceberg of what's happening in people's lives. That is one of the huge things I learned going through this is like everybody has their battles and you probably don't know half of it. And so I just try to not um, overreact or take things personal unless there's something I can do to change myself to help but you know we're all responsible for ourselves and um we're all on a different timetable with that so i've just become more kind and more, less judgmental and i think that's um hard it's really hard when someone is actually hurting you and uh, but lots of things come out sideways and i just think uh, in life in pe in people who are are under um you know, stress or in depression, have not dealt with something in their life. So I'm learning to just give people grace. That's what I'm learning the most of. Yeah. And I wish, I wish my mom would have told me this when I was little, because for not even years, decades, I was running around thinking, oh my God, they reacted like this. Why were they so nasty? What is it about me? And I was always looking for the Taking it culture. personal. Everything is personal, right? Yeah, but personal, yeah. exactly. But it, not personal in a way that oh, I'm going to punch you, you know. I, you know, and yeah. you know, but personal in the sense that I would retreat and I would have, I would have thought I would be feeling bad about myself for three days. And it's already, you know, in any situation, we have our stories, we have our path, and we have a whole pile of things to deal with. And then you're getting these negative resonances, mm -hmm. and it piles on it instead of being told, look, when somebody doesn't say hello to you, it's their problem because literally 99% of the time it wasn't you pulling that out, but them, you know, having a reason why they're not in a good mood. And it is and, so pivotal to a good life, right? Yes. And I think what I've learned is find your people who are your cheerleaders. Like I have um, a few people who I, they will tell me the truth but they also are just constantly um, encouraging me, and I can depend on them. And so, and I, and I am that person for other people. Um, I think it's really important to have your crew of people who um, who are honest, but also super supportive. And um, I mean, I have one woman. Her name's Patty. And I just, you know, if I start to doubt myself or feel like I'm a failure or uh, feel like people hate me, whatever, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, hey, we need to have coffee because like I need a pep talk, you know, like my mother was not that person for me. Mm -hmm. In fact, she was a very, um, she had her own like really uh, tragic life story and she just didn't have a lot of tools um, in her tool chest there. And so uh, my aunt growing up lived next door and thank God, because she was that person who could like, you know, when you were just really struggling, build you up. Um, and so was my dad. But I just realized in life that we all need those people. Totally. So 
I really encourage people, if you don't have that kind of person, there's a lot of people like that out there. Just find, find that person. Find them. <laughs> and people, actually, right? Exactly. Yeah. Actually, uh, when you are in, in your own pickle, okay, you actually find out who are the real um, friends. And I think also in, in the book, in one of the episodes, you describe very well that when once you came out, there were people that were getting closer and became mm -hmm. your tribe. And then there were those that, including some doctors that just fell off the, you know, the, the uh, wayside. And, and that is okay. It's kind of like a detoxing. Mm -hmm. And I think the balance here is to keep on growing as well. Have your tribe and your vibe and your cheerleaders, as you said, that you retreat and charge from, but also still go and push outside of your comfort zone. So to keep on having what you were saying early on, you know, your kids, they were certainly not cocooned in many ways because, hey, mommy is sick and things need to be done when they need to be done. And they have seen a lot. And this is why they are three independent, strong individuals. Yeah. Not cocooned maybe by love, but certainly not by the circumstances, I guess. But to find this kind of balance, you know, I've met a lot of people who have been sick, not just with HIV, but with cancer and different things. And one thing we all have in common is we we were all surprised at who could handle that kind of ongoing illness and who couldn't. And uh, I never was bitter about the people who couldn't. I mean, people have their own lives and, you know, it, and it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable being around sick people, whether it's um, it's a controversial disease like HIV or you're losing your hair or whatever, you know, not everyone can do it. And then we're all surprised also by the people who we never really, maybe weren't in our inner circle who just show up and they can handle it. So there's that. Um, but what's been interesting is after I read wrote the book, I had several really good friends who weren't involved in my life. Um, and now, uh, you know, we're friends again um, later in life and have grandkids and all that. And after the book came out, two of my very good friends said, I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you. Ooh. And I'm like, yeah, like they read the book and felt really bad that in the 90s, they disappeared because it was hard. It was. And I said, um, it's okay. I never like, I never was mad at you. Like it's, I had, I had the people, God provided the people I needed, basically is how I felt about it. And, and I'm not best friends with those people still. A lot of them, I feel like there's a saying that People come into our life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And I, it was a season that I was very sick and people showed up. And and some of those people I'm still, you know, Christmas card friends with, but not necessarily in my life all the time. It is interesting um, that your crew of people can change in, in as your circumstances in life change, but it's important to have people in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, a crisis is always the asset test in everything. And uh, I guess you're hinting at it, you know, and the most surprising people are all of a sudden there who you've never really actually counted even in your inner circle. And one of the people I think that impressed me most that didn't have to stay with you because there was no blood relations is Scott. Yeah, exactly. I didn't write enough about Scott. You have to know he's a very private person <laughs> so <laughs> you know there's some things that you just don't share um but yeah I mean there was actually a day when I just was like I wouldn't fault you if you don't want to stay with me this is a lot you know um but the whole you know in sickness and in health for better or for worse kind of held true and we've been married 41 years now and beautiful um, it's it's been a crazy ride so well I yeah, can I can I, I can I say that a very fortunate person yes no uh, he's find Scott and marry him. <laughs> yeah you'd marry him again huh oh absolutely wonderful any day of the week you know nothing comparable nothing comparable with any you know fatal disease um I had a skiing accident and I broke my pelvis in four different places. So the okay. question was, will I will I be able to walk or not? But that wasn't really the issue. I just knew I have a, um, a very beautiful collection of super high heels 
you you know you don't really wear them to walk you just wear them to stand because you can't yes. walk in them but I love them and um but I knew how you know I just felt so vulnerable and I was embarrassed and it made me think that my husband he was so sweet and so caring to having um your husband take you wash you because you can't or hold you whilst it is it was really three months difficult until I started walking again and and I thought and I said to Nani I said listen if anything happens in the sense that I cannot be there for you as a partner as a wife please find somebody that can because this is what I would do from from love you know saying please lead your life you don't need I'm I'm okay kind of thing so like it would be my protection as a wife or as a mother in that sense that I'd say, please, at least you be happy. And that makes me happier than I am right now. Then thinking, oh my God, I have even the guilty conscience of having him, you know, feeling responsible or throwing me a pity party, basically. Yeah, I think the caregiver role is pretty, pretty, um, pretty difficult because you don't get a lot of attention, but you get all the work. And when I was very, very sick, I literally had those three little kids. So um, there were many days Scott went to work. He got the kids to school. He made the dinner. He got them in bed. You know, I mean, um, while not being able to tell anyone what was going on. (laughs) So, yeah, I, I look back and I just think, you know, I was the most blessed person on earth to be married to him at the time. But I've also met people, young people who have cancer and they'll just, there's a real guilty feeling when you're laying in your room or on the couch as a mom and you can't actually do your job um, as a mom. And um, I think anyone who's like critically ill has felt that. And, and it's, um, it's very depressing. It's devastating. Uh, It's devastating. And you have this beautiful memoir apart uh, I think it's called Ryan and the Milk, and I just couldn't. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I love I love the title first of all, and I just can imagine that baby boy, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, doing it himself basically um, without mommy it is it was quite touching. A couple of more questions, and then um, I know you have uh, commitments. I let you go. First of all, is your concept of uncertainty, you know, and life. Because I feel that, um, especially us rich societies, Western societies, we've been kind of hibernating over the last 20 to 30 years of, hey, we are okay, everything is functioning, and if it is not, we'll just develop some technology to get us out of the rut, which we now see is not the, the case, for example, with climate change. So, and if I look back then at the evolution of mankind, we are not, you know, uncertainty is like like the base stone of whatever we're trying to build. What is it, what is your your thinking around uncertainty, the concept of uncertainty? What would you pass on to, you know, other generations, other people that listen to our conversation? Well, I mean, I I just lost a very um a very dear soul last Thursday um suddenly who he, and he was 38 years old and has two small children and um nothing is certain, you know, other than, um, you know, the world will probably keep turning for, you know, unless we destroy it, but it's like, you know, I mean, life goes on, but not necessarily with you and, um, or with your loved ones. And I guess what I would say is, you know, be certain in the moment. It's like, you got this day going. It's like, you know, don't hold back, um, your, appreciation for people tell people you love them um often um don't wait you know if it's and all is if it's at all in your means to do the things you want to do in life do them um i think covid actually opened our eyes to a bit of that my um brother-in-law died of covid and i said to scott after his brother died i said you know that boat you want like I'm not sure we can afford it but go get it because we don't know like we don't we're we're not even young people anymore it's like if you really want to do something um or something you you value something then 
you know, grasp hold of that and, and make the most of it. Um, yeah, I guess I just, I don't think certainty is a thing. <laughs> um, we, we had our family vacation a couple of weeks ago and, uh, Ryan got COVID, so they they had to delay, and they're in LA. In the meantime, they had a hurricane and an earthquake, and then we had fires. My one daughter got caught in a fire, um, not like they were the car on the I-5 that, I mean, I-90 that couldn't get through for three hours, and then they had to stay in the city. Like, I'm just like, Finally, everyone showed up for three days, but we had a smoke index that was like in the 400s where we were. But it's like, okay, we just had fire, smoke, hurricane, uh, you know, there were floods. There COVID. Was yeah. Wake. I'm like, Perfect storm. nothing is guaranteed. Like, you know, just, but somehow we got together, you know, and it's like, I feel like that's life right now. It's like, um, our world is a little uh, tumultuous. It's like there's nothing guaranteed. Um, yeah, it's like hug each other, tell each other you love them, go do what you love to do, make plans sooner than later. Um, I guess that's my view on uncertainty. I just think it is uncertain. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so with you there. And what you said right at the beginning of um, of your answer is that only the moment, the now is really certain. And that is really what Eckhart Tolle, I don't know, or he's called Eckhart Tolle in America, is a German um, a doctor. And he looks at the only real thing is really right now, as you and I do we speak, that was already the past, what I just said. And I haven't said yeah. the future yet. Yeah. And I think if you think about life in that concept that the reason why only now is real it because is not only because we are here right now, but also in this moment, what we say will create our past and our future. So it really is something that is all incumbent incumbent. Having said that, I also think people really need hopes and dreams and things that they're working on. I think that's where our creative life comes from. I think um that's what gets us up in the morning. Uh, that's what gives us energy. But I also think that having lived as long as I have, even in that creative creativity, those hopes, those things you're building, I have a different view, I think, of failure. I think, um, you know, I used to not try things because I, I, you know, I'm a perfectionist. So I thought, what if I fail? You know, <laughs> that would be bad. So I wouldn't even do it, right? And I think what I've learned, especially through the 3030 project, which had every chance of failing, I mean, it was a huge goal. Really, even if we do fail at something, we're learning and it's going to make our, you know, like it's part of the process. And so, yeah, I do think there, there's, it's important to have hopes and dreams and, and envision a different future. So having said, there's no certainty. I also think living in the moment is important, but also like, having like uh, dreams for the future are, are also really important. And this is exactly how your project 3030 started as well. If you want to uh, tell us a little bit about it, and then I would like to, to finish with the actual purpose of it all. Well, the 3030 project, I was working with um, an organization called Construction for Change that builds infrastructure around the world in impoverished areas um, for other organizations that are usually for healthcare, education, or some community um, building. At the same time in 2014, it was my 30 year anniversary of being HIV positive, and my kids wanted to do something to commemorate that. So, my big idea was to have our family raise enough money to build one healthcare facility with construction for change. Um, and Ryan, who in 2014, um, you know, I just won. Uh, for Grammys and was on the top of his <laughs> popularity. Um, he was like, mom, we can't just build one. You've lived 30 years. We need to build 30. Yeah. And I was just like, uh, 30 is so many more than one. But somehow he talked me into this and, you know, he had a real platform to, um, to announce this from, 
we ended up on lots of national talk shows. Um, and I had the means through working with the Construction for Change to know a lot of organizations that needed infrastructure. Um, so we wanted it to be a five-year project, mostly because I like having a beginning and an ending to things. And we were actually just raising the funds for these buildings. Um, construction for Change was was prior pri primarily the ones that we're going to build them we did have a couple other buildings built by other organizations um and yeah so i started out with just doing this my you know after the initial indiegogo and all the tv stuff everyone went back to their day jobs and it was just me i'd wake up in the night sweating going what in the world did i just tell all of america i was going to do because it was a lot you have I mean, to you just think about remodeling your kitchen once. We'll have it be a whole building in nine different countries for 18 organizations. Like it, it was overwhelming. Um, but we built a team of women and slowly by slowly, um, we started building these buildings and, and then we started measuring the impact. We we had one woman doing uh, measurement and, and evaluation and, and it, we actually saw that it was true that healthcare spaces could create healthcare access for people that didn't have it. And once we had that data, um, our fundraising efforts kind of um, just exploded. accelerated. And so we did fund all of these buildings in five years. So our funding was done in 2019. And, um, and then we had some COVID delays with building, but our last building of the 30 is, is being built right now. So Amazing. Yeah. How much did you manage to raise in total to to? Well, we raised several thousand. I mean, th several million dollars. But also, I think we had a lot of pro bono gifting kind from architects. From like, it's really a hard number to pin down because so much of our services are pro bono. Um, we had a lot of project managers who worked for free. We had uh, or for housing, and then and then somewhere along the line. Uh, in the late, um, oh, I'd say 2017 to 2018, construction for change changed from sending anyone to these sites to using all indigenous and local builders. So we now have a big hub in um, Kenya and um, several project managers coming out of that, mostly who are women, which is kind of amazing because in the U.S. only 8% of project managers are women. And we have like 75 to 80% of our- You have them all. <laughs> you have them all. It's and then, you know, I always say, if you want a project done under budget and on time, hire a woman. <laughs> I can't say anything. I always say I'm not a feminist, I'm feminine, but there is some truth. I also invest in, you know, startup companies, and I do see the difference between female CEOs and male CEOs, um, and, you know, C-levels in general between male and female. And I sometimes wonder, uh, are the women just literally better at delivering because we still have that chip on our shoulder that we are being watched more or we just need to well, yeah. always over deliver? I think it's true. I think we don't. I think as women in leadership roles, you don't have as much of a buffer to fail at something. Um, you finally got there and um, there's not as much. Uh, there's not as many margins for women in those leadership positions. So you do feel a lot of pressure to um, to be successful. Absolutely. And talking about success, 3030, um, super successful. So congratulations. Um, and in such short amount of time, we are also in fundraising for our projects as investors. And wow, what you've been able to do, we have not been able to do it, so chapeau. Um, or we found it very hard uh, in these economic times. Last question, Julie, I would like to ask you, and that is, uh, you know, as we talked about uncertainty, what would you say to anybody with, you know, your um, life story now, which you, in episodes, put in this fantastic book, what would you say, what would you advise, or how would you define purpose, how to find your purpose, how you actually find out what your purpose is? Is there such thing as purpose? How do you feel about it? And what would you, what would you pass on? 
I definitely think they're that that we each are uniquely made um, for um, for some purpose. I just I have always believed that. I think some people find it really early in life. Ryan knew he would be um, in entertainment and in music very young. I mean, my my daughters always laugh because they're like Ryan knew what he's going to do with his life when he was like twelve. And I, and they're they're all pushing forty, and they're like, we still haven't figured it out, <laughs> you know. I mean, and I I think that was more my life. Just just you know, I had I knew the things I valued, but as far as how to work that out in my life, um, I think uh, as a mom, I would and with 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 a you know ongoing disease. I don't know, even though I had ideas of, of how to work that out logistically, I didn't have the space for it. It wasn't the season of my life to really do a 30-30 project when I was 40. Um, so I think, again, there's seasons, but I do think um, we, we are wired uniquely. I've always known that I'm more of a thinker than a feeler. I have always known that I have a lot of compassion for people on the margins that are struggling. I have always had a strong sense of justice and yet know that the world isn't that just, but I've always worked for that in, in just so many ways. So I think we all have these characteristics that we could identify as uniquely how we're made. And then I would say to people, you know, the, the perfect thing in life is to marry um, something you love with something that is actually your work or your vocation. But if that's not the case, um, and it, it isn't the case for probably most people, it's like find those outside interests that that do align and and then I look back at my life and all the weird things I've done over the years. I mean, I feel like as a mom, I had a different job every two years, just trying to work it out with my kids' schedule. But there was a piece of everything. Um, like if you would have told me my whole career would be a, that I'm going to end up being a public speaker. Um, if you would have told me that at 30, I'm like, yeah, right. Um, but then, you know, I was a teacher. Then I ended up on a speaker's bureau. And then, you know, like there's all these little pieces of things along the way. If you would have told me I would be like in construction, like <laughs> I, I laugh every time I give a speech for construction for change. You're like, don't, you know, you, you don't want me to build your building. But I know a lot about construction now, which is, was a key piece to the 3030 project. For years, we were a nonprofit, and sometimes that was frustrating, but all these things came together to enable the 3030 project to even be an idea in my head or something that we could pull off. So don't underestimate the value of what space you're in right now, even if it doesn't make sense, because I think all of those things in our life kind of build on themselves and create a whole that is bigger than any individual thing. No, that's so, absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And I think from what I would make from what you just said, so the red thread, um, being a teacher, um, being a mother, being a carer, being a teacher, being also in the Bible group, having always these community meetings as well. Uh, you know, the red thread for me is your giver, your sharer, whatever wisdom you have or knowledge you want to pass on, you want to make help people, not even in need, just maybe help them to be better from their good position they are on, they can elevate. This is somehow how how I see now the, the Julie that you kind of described from my own individual interpretation as I'm as I'm hearing. And please forgive me if I'm totally um wrong on that one, but I think this is the question of purpose goes through my mind. And earlier, you also said, you know, people, they can't wait to get into, uh, go to into retirement and just play golf. And all of a sudden, they just say, oh, well, it's not it. They want to do something again. They want to be active. And for me, I think purpose is exactly what you were saying, is marrying a sense of what you love for me is a sense of joy. That in the, mom in the morning, I get up and I'm like happy to do whatever I'm planning to do. And that is already purpose enough because for me, it's, it's important. Hence, I will do my best. Hence, it will have a good 
um, I don't know, energy or vibration through society, unless I am, of course, a, you know, <laughs> psychological, pathological murderer going around, you know, killing people. Apart from that, I mean, in a normal sense. And for me, the sense of joy in what I'm doing is already creating so much positivity that it can only be of purpose then to a wider society, a wider community as well. Yeah. It's fun. I have six grandkids and it's just fun to see them all as little kids. There's two two that are 10, uh, two that are almost seven, and then four-year-old and a one-year-old. But it's like, they're all so uniquely wired. And it's like, I look at them all the time and I think, oh, it, it's it's like, I'm kind of trying to imagine um, who they're going to be, who yeah. they're going to be, you yeah. know? And I just think we all have different purposes, but it's really fun to just, uh, and it was fun as a teacher. And then I was a men college mentor for 10 years. It's fun to see um, kids in the young age or in those early twenties where they're so excited about, their future it's that gives me a lot of energy but um I always tell them you know you, you don't have to figure it out all at once even when you're 40 or or 50 like you don't just keep doing what you love doing it'll make sense eventually <laughs> you know and keep daring is what you said as well yeah. so try yourself out don't take those don't... risks you know you have you have to take risks in order to like and and maybe you'll feel but that failure might be you know key to what you're going to succeed in so yeah so with you well julie thank you so much for your time um well, i know it's a, <laughs> it's a it's a precious time at the moment as you've mentioned it and thank you very much for ch sharing such such personal information that it's a it's a um, sad time at the moment in your own family right now this book julie um for me has been, you know, also an inspiration on how to write books if you can't write a novel or can't write books unless it's a nonfiction. It's like, how am I going to write about my life? And I think these kind of uh, episodes and, and lookbacks are so beautiful, potpourri, and uh, at the end really come through with a life story. So thank you so much for writing this together with Jenny Koenig. I think she's an awesome friend. Doesn't matter how much younger she is. Um, and I, I wish you to have the longest of lives continuing so you can keep on sharing, being there now also for your grandchildren, for your children, for your husband and your awesome friends that stood by you and those awesome people that owned up to not having stood by you and are potentially back in your life. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I just want to add that all the proceeds from our book go to organizations working on healthcare access and equity. So uh, if you purchase the book, it's going to a good cause. Absolutely, 100%. And there is also, where could one find out more about you, the, the project, and also about the book? Um, well, our website is stillpositive.com for the book. And then if you want to go a deep dive into the 3030 projects, it's 3030project.org. So. And Julie, I will have everything under the description, under our conversation on the YouTube channel uh, announced also on the podcast. So thank you so much. And with that, my dear On The Pulse community, thank you again for joining me for another fascinating, unique conversation. The reason you're here is because you're curious, because you want to find out. And hopefully my conversations with these wonderful people, just as Julie Lewis, will inspire you going forward, never giving up and knowing that there's always a solution. I see you at the next conversation. Thank you. Till then, bye. We go out there together. We begin to share together. We find our way.